Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. It's Demetrius here again from Pixel. Today, I want to discuss something quite important and shed some light onto three different companies which today currently are the behemoths of the world and pretty much dictate the future. A lot of my students do request this particular type of presentation and I've uh, been working on this for a long time because I've also been working in the industry for a very long time. I get to learn these things over time and then I've created a nice little presentation for you so that it shines a bit of light onto these companies so you can understand the markets and how they're operating today, the political motivations, the agendas, and just the narrative control that is happening. And of course, where's the future? What's the future going to be like? And where are we sort of moving towards? And none of this information I'm going to talk about today is hidden away or in the shadows unlike some of these companies operating in the shadows, uh, even though they're very visual in the industry. It's all available, all this information is available on the internet uh, within the companies that I'm talking about on their websites. There's nothing difficult about this information to find. But once you start pulling on these threads and you start to see how these are companies operating, especially when you've worked with two or three of them, like I've worked with two of them, it does shine a light as to the the, the whole strategy behind these companies and what's really happening in the world. And it's important for us to understand, okay, there's no easy way to deal with this. There's no easy way to get rid of these companies because you can't. They are absolutely paramount to the way the, the world functions. And But what is important is to shed light and to have a bit more transparency and understand how these companies work because they need to be more transparent. There's no doubt about this. And the way the world functions right now doesn't seem to be gelling correctly. So let me break down how everything works. I've got a nice little presentation. I'm going to take you through it and I want to show you kind of who controls the world today when it comes to finance and money and just in general, everything around it. So I'm going to break you into the presentation and let's talk about what's happening. So who really controls the world? Right? There's, there's actually this hidden power of finance that many people may be familiar with or may have heard of, but they don't really truly get the picture right. So, okay, we live in a world where technology giants like Apple, Google, Amazon, Meta, many other companies, Microsoft as well, seem to be dominating our lives. Okay, and they're doing a pretty good job and on, from the consumer side, but we're looking at it from a consumer perspective. Yes, they do have a lot of money, and yes, they in, in some cases like Apple and Google, for example, have a lot of cash flow, which is very important for the industries. And you'll see how important that is later. But behind the scenes, okay, behind the scenes, it's a different kind of power that operates. Uh, one that is less visible, yet more impactful. Even though all this information is very visually on the internet, it's very tricky to actually put it all together and to understand how these companies work unless you work with them. This power really rests with a select group of financial institutions and they all, they're operating, you know, with companies that you can see, but they do operate in the shadows. They wield influence over global markets and economies. Now, there are many companies that do this, but I'm going to talk about three predominant companies in the industries. Okay. And these companies are starting off with a company like BlackRock. And I'm sure you've heard of BlackRock before. You've probably heard it in the news. Well, because recently they've actually been exposed a little bit in terms of what they're doing. But they're a colossus of finance and they can't go away. I mean, this is just one company you can't get rid of because one of the most it's one of the most prominent players in the financial game is BlackRock because of its asset management, behemoth ability and staggering personal um, worth and that is you know they, they're looking at their own worth of 10 trillion in assets under their own ownership let alone how far they extend and what they manage outside this 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 colossal sum surpasses most gdp of every nation that we have in the world with the exception of the united states and china but not for long blackrock's getting to the point right now where they're going to surpass that pretty soon and BlackRock's reach is really, it extends beyond its own holdings. It, it, it really, it, it, it owns a stake of almost 90% of all S&P 500 companies, the top 500 companies in the world. And it, it grants them immense influence over their corporate decisions. So these four things, 
are what make BlackRock stand out and why they're so powerful in the industry. And that is global reach, unrivaled power, political influence, and basically the unseen hand that you may not be familiar with. But essentially, the global reach is where the real key is. BlackRock's presence is felt across the globe. They've got offices in over 30 countries. The global network allows basically to leverage vast resources that they have, and they, they're able to influence and shape markets and economies worldwide. This then gives them an unrivaled power because the sheer size of BlackRock's portfolio and its influence over major corporations makes it a force really to be reckoned with. And its decisions have ripple effects, okay? I mean, they have ripple effects and reverberate throughout the global economy. And you can see that. We saw that in the, the financial sort of crisis in 2020 with all governments in the United States, basically, uh, they, they had to go get a bailout. And who did they go to get a bailout from? It was BlackRock. Okay, that's what happened. Because they had the financial clout to do this. And um, of course, you know, this is where... BlackRock really benefited because they basically bought out assets for almost anything. Well, almost nothing, really. And and really, the governments gave in. They caved in. And um, the whole problem was really started by, by the financial market. So really, it was a almost a catch-22 scenario. Right? They created the problem and they fixed the problem, which is fascinating. It's an incredible thing to read in history, let alone all the, the, the previous sort of crises that we've had, or going all the way back to 2018 even further. The other thing that's really powerful about BlackRock is their political influence. It's really big. Their vast resources give it significant political leverage. It wields, as a company, influence over policymakers and, and governments. And it, this shapes regulation and economic policy. And it has a massive impact across the world, not just the United States, not just, you know, the United Kingdom, many companies, many organizations, sorry, and across the, across the globe, many governments. But what you don't see is the unseen hand. The ability for them to influence extends far beyond the boardrooms of major corporations and governments. It operates in the shadows, shaping global markets, economies, policies, governments in ways that are often unseen and unacknowledged. Okay, and you're never going to get to see that kind of that kind of thing happening. But it's definitely happening. There's no doubt about it. You can see it clearly in the industries. The other company that's rather a colossus, a really behemoth in the industry, because it's been around a long time, it's what we call State Street. And State Street is the legacy of financial services. They're a prominent player in the world of finance because they've got a rich history. They, they boast the history of being around since 1792. That's huge. And its main uh, areas of operation are investment, servicing, and investment management. And they really positioned as a crucial player in, in the global financial system. Now, they, they use a subsidiary of uh, State Street Global Advisors, SSGA, and, and the company sort of manages a vast portfolio of investments, including the widely popular SBDRs and ETFs. And, and I know of State Street because I've, in, I've been involved in stock exchange trading and I, I, I get to work with State Street type of uh, investments all the time, especially ETFs. And... The three things that really stand out with State Street are the investment servicing, investment management, and global reach, once again. So the investment servicing, it allows them to have to provide a, a vast range of services to institutions, individuals, um, including things like custody, fund administration, securities lending. These services are essential for smooth functioning of the financial markets. When you want to stabilize the financial markets, that's where State Street kicks in. And you get to see that all the time when it comes to lending. The other thing is investment management. And through the SSGA, their subsidiary, State Street offers a wide array of investment strategies across all sorts of asset classes, catering to a, a really big, like a diverse need. Well, uh, the, the, so the diverse needs of clients, and it ranges from pension funds to insurance companies, you name it. And that's something that you can you can clearly see. You can't really get rid of something like this. They're, they're truly making the financial industry run fluidly, like almost like they're the oil to the industry, you know, to make the engine run smoothly. And 
their global reach is huge. They're over they're in over 100 markets around the world globally and their financial services are so diverse their footprint gives them unparalleled advantage um, to basically point on and move forward in terms of international financial trends and they can kind of dictate financial futures and trends which is huge it's massive and it's you know all this information is available online, but it's something to think about because that kind of colossal power can wield negative repercussions in, 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 in the globe. But there's more to this. The other one that's very interesting to see, and I've, done, and I've also worked with Vanguard before because of certain types of investments. Vanguard as a company is a little bit more client-focused as a giant in the industry. They stand out as one of the world's largest asset management firms, yes, but it's also known for its low-cost index funds and ETFs, which I've had the pleasure of working with. And what makes Vanguard really unique is its ownership structure, the way it's managed. You know, it's owned by its funds, so which in turn, those funds are owned by the investors. So actually investors call the shots here unlike a board of directors and a CEO and pretty much the company, right? And then, of course, investors, you know, because they are the, the owners, because they're managing the company, it's client-centric focused as a company and it aligns its interest with those of the investors. So now the investors don't have to have a short-term um, investment and then an exit strategy to leave the organization, get paid out the investment and move on to the next investment. What happens with Vanguard is investors jump into inv Vanguard, they stay in Vanguard because they're constantly reshaping the markets and investing in things that's going to constantly make the money. There's no need for exit strategies. And this was what makes Vanguard different. Yes, they've got four main things, the low cost index funds, client ownership, global reach and transparency. But it, it's what makes them different, and that is because of the, the, the shareholders, the investors. And the low-cost index funds, um, Vanguard's index funds, basically, which track specific indexes in the markets, they offer investors a, a low-cost or cost-effective way to access the diverse portfolios wherever they are. And these funds have gained immense popularity for their affordability and transparency, basically. The other thing, of course, is the client ownership, the ability for the client, the investor who's actually in, in an investor in the company, they own the structure in, in, in essence. They are part of the structure. So it ensures that the company's interests aligns with those of the investors. And the, this fosters a culture of long term value proposition, long term value creation and long term client satisfaction, which is huge. This is why. You'll see companies like Disney, Walt Disney, producing absolute trash in the industry for the last 15 years. Globally, they're a financial loss, uh, an absolute abysmal loss. Nothing they've actually purchased or created in the last 15 years has made them money. In fact, they've lost billions. But yet, there's money still coming into the company. And people don't understand how a company like, for example, recently Walt Disney has invested $180 million in creating a television series called The Acolyte, which is an absolute abortion and failure in the industry. And it's not about who created it and how they created it. Sorry, who created it and the political motivations and agendas in the film, in, in the television series, because it is very heavily politically motivated. But it's not really that. It's the fact that it's poorly written. It's badly managed. It is terribly directed. The production value is terrible. There are, the special effects are rubbish. And yet $180 million was spent on eight episodes. That's $22.5 million per episode. And if you look at the length of each episode, which is roughly 30 minutes, if you calculate the mathematics, that is $800,000 per minute wasted on something that will not make them money, but will actually put them in debt a further three to 400 million. So why is this still possible? But because Vanguard has invested in Disney and so has BlackRock and so has State Star State's um, side. And basically, <laughs> the money just keeps on flowing into these companies like Disney and the rest of them that are failing. But 
they're still producing trash. And you're wondering how these companies are staying afloat. Well, it's because of big behemoths like this. And what's really the strategy behind this? Well, if you think about it, when they keep on lending money to companies like corporations, and these corporations keep on failing to make profits, what's going to happen? These large behemoths are going to call on these loans. And when these companies can't pay those loans, they're going to have to either fold or fold into Vanguard, BlackRock, and Stateside. And essentially, Vanguard, BlackRock, and Stateside gain company assets and leverage even more and even cheaper than just buying the companies outright. Because <laughs> they let them run to the ground and they take them over. It's a... <laughs> This is not a new concept, people. This is what all companies have been doing for the last hundreds and hundreds of years. But the difference is now they've got such a behemoth amount of money that it's very easy for them to do this. And they're in the long-term game. They don't care about the short-term game. Most other companies around the industry operate on the short-term gains, which is a mistake. But this, these companies, the financial behemoths, they've got the long-term game in place. And because of their global reach, like Vanguard's, you know, Vanguard operates globally, serving millions of clients, including sort of individual investors, which I'm one of them. And I've been with Vanguard in the past. I'm no longer with them because I've invested in other things. Um, but probably with those things I've invested in, those companies have invested with Vanguard. So somewhere along the line, there's Vanguard interaction here. Um, and the financial professionals, they've invested with institutions and all that. So it's a company that's widespread and they reach and they're exerting themselves across all the financial markets. So it's a pretty big deal. But what makes them better than, say, BlackRock and Stateside is this transparency and simplicity. I think that's what's really key here. And you can't think of, you know, BlackRock and Stateside and Vanguard as evil companies. Of course not. They're running the entire market, right? The whole global economy. But what's nice about Vanguard is a lot more transparency. Because I've also worked with Vanguard and I've seen the investment process behind this, I've definitely preferred working with them than rather the other two, but you can, because it's it's all investor focused and centric, but it does, you know, it lends to being more simply set up and um, it's, it's a beautiful investment process and it makes it accessible to the wide audience, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't have negative repercussions in the industry, because it does. Because of their long-term gains and long-term strategy, the short-term thinking about com that companies and corporations have doesn't work with this. And this is where they fail. And of course, this is where Vanguard, I guess, sleight of hand comes along and sort of takes over companies. And that's in a way a negative, And it's something that we need to shed a light on. Now, why am I talking about these three in this way? Well, let's look at them together. And this is where you need to start thinking about how all this stuff works. And start being concerned both positively and negatively. I know that sounds crazy, but let me give you a bit more context. Currently in the world today, there's roughly 440, 450 trillion dollars operating with all the financial economies around the world. That's the kind of money that's floating around the world at the moment that's been managed and, man and manipulated and driven around. Because the combination of BlackRock, State Street, and Vanguard, which, by the way, they share investment and shares within each other, hey? so effectively they're operating as a group. Because those three working together effectively control roughly 80% or even close to 90% today of the world's money and assets and managing those assets, even though they've got their own you know, BlackRock has its own 10 trillion investments and all that, and, and their own assets. Together, these three also control roughly 80 to 90% of the world's money and all the global economies, which if you think about it carefully, that's a staggering roughly 352 trillion of the 440 to 450 trillion in assets and money represented in the world. That is, that's a significant portion of the world's total wealth. So as a group, this is unprecedented levels of control by these giants. You know, the immense influence that they have over global markets, economies, governments, policies, laws, and the course of history is something of concern. Of course, it's necessary in the world because it makes the world financially operate. Yes, but it's also a concern because 
Their decisions can have far-reaching consequences and repercussions, impacting the lives of billions of people, and there's nothing you can do about it. You see, what these three companies do together as a strategy is something to think about carefully because let's look at it from the aspect of yes they're doing wonderful things in terms of finance and the, and the global economies but also let's look at the four main things that gets them to do this or allows them to do this and that is first of all market manipulation and market control market management market manipulation ultimately these financial di giants they have the ability to move markets through vast holdings their actions can trigger significant price fluctuations like that. And this impacts fortunes of investors and individuals and businesses alike instantaneously. That can be a very positive thing if you're in the driving seat. But it's quite a negative thing if you go against the grain. Which, of course, by me talking about this also goes, it goes against the grain. But I'm not talking about anything that's not available on the internet you can find i'm not talking about anything negative they, they already talk about this in their own websites they talk about how they do this in the industries on their own on their own applications their own websites their own investors so this is not something new i'm not talking about a conspiracy uh, theory here this is truth now the other thing that should be of concern and you're getting to see this happening now is policy shaping and we've seen this often now, especially since COVID-19. See, their influence extends beyond markets, right? The financial markets. They can basically lobby governments and policymakers to enact regulations and policies that favor their interests, obviously. They're controlling $352 trillion, roughly, of the total pool of 440 to 450 trillion. Of course, they're going to control their assets. They're going to manage their assets. Of course, they're going to do, do things according to their own interests. I mean, that makes sense, right? It's simple business mathematics. So the thing on the other side, though, is this can have significant impact on economic growth, social welfare, and policies, environmental policy, that kind of thing. It might be, it you know, it will influence on the in the long term in terms of policies, but it can also make major destruction for the short term as well, which is not a good thing. And you're getting to see that happening more often than not in the last 10 years. But what's really visible today is narrative control. And we're getting to see that over and over again. Their thought process divide them, cause them to think differently and not the normal way, not the way 90% of the world thinks. And that causes the ability for them or gives them the ability to control the narrative for the future thinking and have, I wouldn't say zombies to deal with, but it's easier to manage people that way. And it's then easier to have future control because they want to stay here. These companies want to stay in business. They want to stay in business longer than you and I are going to be alive, basically. So the point is th this unprecedented control that they have of these financial institutions they have that they have over this global wealth is in a way giving them the significant say in the way they shape the future which is good and bad obviously we've seen recently that it's all mostly bad and their decisions can impact direction of technology and advancement and economic development and societal progress which is we're seeing it very prominent today we're in 2024 and we're still using keyboards mouse screens tablets we, that's ridiculous. Computers have been around longer than, you know, than I've been alive. So at the end of the day, I'm 50 years old. So it doesn't make any sense. Technology, if because I've been in IT and technology for 37 years now and since I started working. And I have seen technology come out 20 years ago and then disappear. And all of a sudden, we've seen, we've seen technology come out. The same technology come out now. And people think it's novel and new and fantastic, which is nonsense. Because I've seen technology like that appear a long time ago and yet it was stifled and pulled back. And you get to see this a lot when you're in the industry. You get to see things coming out and then disappearing. Okay, and here's, for example, Google Chrome, right? Chrome operating system, Chrome OS. I, I saw Google Chrome before Google had its hands on it. I was working in an organization in a country I can't mention. 
and I was working on a project called Inopsis, which I can mention, Internet Operating System, and that was 20 years before Google had even hands on their own Chrome OS. Funny enough, though, when I got hold of my hands on the back end code of Chrome OS, I could see that actually this was the same system I had dealt with 20 years earlier in a different company, but it was just modified. So you can clearly see nothing's new today, except that it's just older technology that actually was particularly good being brought back into the market. So what they're doing is they're not only stifling technology, but holding it back on purpose so that they can control the narrative, control the future, but at the same time, it, they're preventing advancement. And it happens in economic development. In 2024, 2024 we should not have any famine in the world today. These companies that earn so much money, okay, a billion could solve the famine like that. And they got trillions in their wake. So they, they need to stop preaching to the world and uh, like governments need to stop preaching to people and their citizens and say, we're going to solve this problem. We're going to solve that problem. No, you're not. You can't. Because the objective is not to solve the problem because they need to have this kind of societal progress being managed and controlled. And that's just the fact of life. Anybody who has any savvy and any mind that makes sense in yourself, you'll understand that this is what's happening. It's just not very visual. You don't often see this. And this boils down to this phase. And this is where we start to think about, okay, these companies are very important to have. They, they allow the entire financial market to work. And it's very important for companies and governments and organizations and corporates and individuals and investors to have this. Otherwise, the, the world won't function. We know we need this. However, there's not enough transparency. And what's been wielded now is the divide. It's been, it's one of these things that have been put together is this weapon of control. And we can see it now because people since COVID-19 have woken up. You know, one of the most concerning aspects of the financial dominance is the use of division to maintain control. This is not a new concept. <laughs> if you look at the art of war as a book and you read it and you look at all the battles and the wars that go back in history, divide and conquer is not something new, ladies and gentlemen. What's that's not new. This is not a new concept. So because these companies as a group can wield that much power and control $352 trillion out of the 450 odd trillion dollars in the market, why shouldn't they have that ability and control ability to, yes, have this play out the way it's supposed to play out because they're controlling, the, they're managing their own assets, they're protecting their own assets. Of course, they're going to do this. So we see this played out in the real world. You know, with societies increasingly being polarized. You could ask yourself, why is that happening now? We're all human. We all come from the same place. We all bleed. Irrespective of what color you are, creed you are, caste you are, gender you are, male or female, whatever. The point is, polarizing people is basically turning them into a division. When you divide people, it's easier to conquer. It's like going into a field of battle and you've got a thousand people you have to go through and try and deal with. It's a lot easier to take away a hundred of them and deal with them first and then hit the next hundred and the next hundred than it is to deal with all thousand at the same time. Come on, this is not rocket science, people. This is easy to understand. So at the end of the day, this divide, the ability to polarize is big because these financial powers use their control over media narratives to create an amplified divisions within societies. We saw that even with Donald Trump being uh, put into power as well. There's good things and bad things with that, right? But you find me a leader today in government. Find me a leader today that is perfect. You see, the one thing people don't realize as citizens and as consumers, you don't have to like your leader. As long as your leader gets to where you're supposed to get to and allows mankind to progress forward and advance, that's a leader. You do get an occasional time where leaders are incredibly good in terms of their citizens and what they've done and they become legends. That's different. But some leaders, most people don't like them. And there's nothing wrong with it. As long as the leaders get to where you're supposed to get to, you may not need to like them, but it doesn't mean they're totally and completely bad. 
Think about that carefully before you next tack on an attack against someone who's a government official or whatever. They're all problems. They all have their own individual issues. And in fact, corruption exists everywhere in the world. And I don't care what people think. It is the truth. Corruption is everywhere. So these financial powers can then use their control over the media narratives, right? And then they can manipulate, and along the lines of that, manipulate political aff affiliation and change things like race thought, you know, and social classes and, and create new or bring back things that we've tried for so many years to get over and fix that it just causes people to divide. And then that causes people not to think together and think the same way, which then loses control and loses power. And that gives them the ability to do things like strategize the future, change markets, manipulate. So really the division as a strategy works very well. And we know that in a battle. So it's powerful to maintain control. It's very important. And a divided society is less likely to challenge the status quo or demand systematic change. Sometimes it's important to have division though. You've got to look at it from an aspect of also history. I'm also half Greek and I understand democracy, you know, but democracy was originally designed so that it can protect the majority of what people want to have happen. So it'll protect the majority, right? But it also needs to also not just um, implement what the majority wants, but it also has to protect the minority which is what's been forgotten about democracy today. So division gets created and division then tarnishes things like democracy. It tarnishes things like everyone working together and thinking together. And yes, as as great as the divide is a weapon of control and it is a weapon of, you know, keeping people uh, separate and making them not being able to think together, which is a great way to manage their assets, their control. But what's happening is it's very short term thinking as well from these companies, because if they allow mankind to all think together as one hive, mankind today would be on a completely different planet. We'd be space race taking on new planets. Because if you give mankind the ability to work and think like a think tank, all people working together, not only would these companies benefit far longer into the future and far more than what they currently are, but everyone in the world would benefit. You see, the problem of the thinking right now is that this idea of using divide as a control and the idea of having all these strategies is very short term thinking by Vanguard, BlackRock and Stateside, because in essence, it's greedy. In the common term, it's greediness and it's also stupidity and futile because in the long term, they all will fail. Now, the other thing that's also happening is social media manipulation is a big deal because we've seen that over and over and over again. And these financial institutions have resources that can influence social media platforms, manipulating algorithms, spreading misinformation to further enhance and, and sort of push their, agend their agencies and agendas and, and, and really to sow discord, which is what happened with so many things like Meta, which is why, you know, Facebook has gone through so many legal cases, but you know, they conformed, they decided to go through those cases, and then they got all this investment from Vanguard and BlackRock and Stateside, and then everything quietened down. All, all of a sudden, TikTok came along, started taking the piece of the pie. Oh, and of course, these companies didn't have the investment in this company, TikTok, so they, they wanted to push the narrative, so they lobbied in government. They got to put TikTok under under law and under court uh, court cases, and then well, TikTok has had to cave in and create an American company and get the investment arm in place. That's the kind of power they wield. But this is where Elon Musk comes along and throws a spanner in the works. Pretty much the same way Steve Jobs did. He threw a spanner in the IT industry and actually became an, an, a disruptor in the industry, which people didn't like. There's, these large organizations didn't like because it gave, even Microsoft's done this, it gave them the power to build their own cash flow so they wouldn't have to rely on these investments. Come on, guys. 
Think about it carefully. So the idea that now Elon Musk has now purchased Twitter has given him the power to within his own company and with the people that work in the company to get around the status quo, to not do what these large companies want them to do. It's a major risk from Elon Musk, absolutely. But can you stop them? No, because he's a visionary. As much as people may not like Elon Musk, he is a visionary. He's a, he, yeah, he's an ex-South African guy, he's South African, but he's also a visionary. And it, what shows is his ability to does not, I mean, to understand how the industry works. Of course, you need the industry. We need financial services. You need these three companies, BlackRock, Stateside, Vanguard. Of course, you need them. But at the same time, he realizes that actually you can do things up to a certain point on your own without having to rely on these companies. And it shows. And this is what's happening. The other thing that you're getting to see as well is control and manipulation. You know, the, this is where the problem lies with dividing. And then by creating this and exploiting divisions within society and these financial powers can really maintain their grip. And, and then the grip on the power they have. And then they can ensure that their interests continue on. But it's, in my opinion, very short lived and also very, very narrow thinking because they don't realize that actually there's more value to mankind thinking together as a hive. There is far more value to that because people are designed to work together. They're designed to, to, to love and appreciate each other and respect each other. We're not by nature designed to be evil. We're not. We're influenced by environments and people. So and, and sort of concepts and policies and laws. So it's very short-term thinking from these companies, and it's, it's understandable, but it's very short-term thinking. And it's actually stupid thinking, because if you look at it in the future, the only way mankind can progress forward and become a space race and actually become a planetary threat to other planets, let's say there are other planets out there that have life, that's the only way we will survive. But if we continue on this path and only allow these financial institutes just to control us with just finances, and if some other crazy space race comes along and tries to take us on, we are in dire straits. Because we won't have any capabilities. Because we don't think as a collective. We're all individual people. We all should have individual thinking. But we should always, always consider how that has repercussions in the collective. Some of these companies, they're doing it to protect their own assets, but at the same time, they're not really thinking about the repercussions and the negative side of things. And they're probably very well aware of the negatives, but the, to them, they're in such control over so much money, it doesn't really dent them in any way. The main problem is this long-term impact. The consequences of division are far-reaching and impactful, and it deals with social cohesion being a problem, and it creates this climate of distrust and animosity, which we're starting to see. And it hinders progress. It undermines the common good, which in turn will cause animosity and discourse and anger against their own companies, which then will let them be in the position to fail. And they will go down this part of failing because at some point in time, the collective of people will work together. It's inevitable. It's part of history. It's what people are all about. You do not have the ability to take away people's freedom. But when you do have that ability and people don't see it and then eventually get to see it, they will rebel. People will rebel. And it's inevitable, Vanguard, stateside, BlackRock, it's inevitable. You're going down a path of ending. It's going to end for you. And unfortunately, I'm not saying it because it's going to happen, because I'm saying it. It's just going to happen because that's the path you've chosen, unfortunately. It's a very narrow thinking path. Now, here's the illusion of choice that we also have to worry about. It is a system of control. right? The problem is not just these companies are powerful. It's that the power is often hidden away. It's operating beneath the surface of the global financial system. We are led to believe that we have choices in the marketplace. But, but in reality, really, the choices are often limited and manipulated by these powerful institutions. And unless you, unless you have like serious clout in the industry and enough cash flow that you can allow yourself to maneuver within the system, well, then you'll fall under control, market manipulation and policy influence, whether you like it or not.
because this is what happens. I mean, they control the flow of information through influencing media and social media platforms and shaping public perception and influencing decisions. And they control the market manipulating part, the, the, they control the market flow and they have the ability to manipulate the markets through their vast holdings. And they created this illusion of the free economy and the free markets and a fair market. And really the most important thing is that they're benefiting themselves and or their allies. Ultimately, that's what happens. I mean, yes, along the way, a lot of companies will actually succeed and they will make a lot of money and whatever, but they're never going to come close to the size of these companies. And really the big problem is the policy influence, where they'll wield influence over policymakers and governments and shaping regulations and economic policies to serve their interests, when often enough, it's at the expense of the public good. And this is where the public reaches a stage where they go, enough is enough. And then a battle kicks in or a war will kick in or massive discourse will kick in and apathy kicks in, which is what's happening right now. And then people will just switch off and then governments will fail. Corporate companies will fail and these organizations will eventually have the worst animosity against them, which is which is where it's leading to. And it's such a shame because they could turn this around and they could really allow mankind to flourish and then they would flourish even more. But, you know, the narrow minded thinking is sad because money, unfortunately, as much as it is a very important tool in the world, it's also an, an exceptionally corrupting tool as well, sadly. So why am I making this presentation? Why am I talking about it? And I'm not talking about anything bad. I'm not angry about anything. It's just the way the world works. I think there needs to be a call for more transparency and accountability. I don't think responsibility is something to think about. I think accountability is the key and transparency is absolutely paramount. There's nothing wrong with having these companies around and doing what they're doing, but it should benefit not just them, it should benefit everyone. What they're currently doing right now is in effect, uh, it goes against democracy. Yes, it goes. they are protecting the majority. Fine, it makes sense. They're protecting the majority, stakeholders, shareholders, investors and whatever, but they're not also... They're, they're, and they're implementing all these things for them, but they're not also protecting the minority. And that's actually going to be a problem for the future because minority eventually becomes the majority. And it's a problem for them. You know, it, it, it's time to shine a light on the hidden power structures that pretty much control the world. And we must demand transparency and accountability for these financial institutions, ensuring that they're held responsible for their actions and their impact on society. It requires a collective effort, really, and, and really to expose the influence and challenge of this dominance. And it's not just to show exposure and accountability and traceability and transparency on what they do negatively. negatively. No, 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 no. It also needs to show the positive side of them because we need this system, but at the same time, it needs to work for everyone. So transparency must demand transparency from these institutions to require them to disclose holdings, strategies, the influence of the policies on the market so that we can see whether this is not just going to benefit only them, but everybody. And if it benefits everybody, go ahead, please, because it benefits everyone. Makes sense. Right? Everyone wants to do well in the world. Why not? We only have 80 to 90 years if you're lucky on this planet. Shouldn't we enjoy everything, including money? Come on, think about it. Then accountability. Yeah, some institutions must be held accountable for their actions. Some of them do go a little bit beyond their, their, their remits, and this is a problem. And their impact on society and the consequences of their decisions are pretty, pretty dire sometimes. So we need stronger regulation and enforcement of mechanisms to ensure that they're held responsible. But here's the thing. You can't go too regulated. There has to be a balance of accountability. Having too much regulation also goes against the market. It also goes against people. We've seen that in history. I don't have to talk about it. It's available to everybody. So you can't always go too far with these things. That's why there needs to be balance. At the moment, there is no balance. It's either complete left or complete right, which makes no sense. It needs to be balanced. Mankind operates at its optimal conditions when they're balanced. Fairness. 
We must work towards creating a fairer financial system that benefits all of society, not just the select few. This requires systematic changes, the addressing and concerns of all the things to do with powers and unequal sort of power distribution and wealth distribution. This is why cryptocurrency is quite a big deal, because there should be there should be a centralized cryptocurrency system for the financial industries and financial markets and, 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 and companies because they need to have more efficient ways of doing things, faster ways of doing things, more cost effective ways of doing things so that it actually can pass that benefit on to the consumers. And then the consumers also need to have their own alternative currencies, not just centralized, but they need to have their own decentralized because what happens if a financial institution decides to go rogue? and decides to do and play God, which maybe could happen, it may happen, and then all of a sudden their citizens and their, their patrons and their, their consumers and whatever just get taken for right and they lose their livelihoods. It doesn't work. You need an alternative system. That's why cryptocurrencies that are decentralized, things like Bitcoin and the rest, are very important in the industry because you need to have that alternative financial system. Otherwise, if you rely on just one system, let's say that the finance institutes institute instigate one financial system, one monetary system, and it completely fails. Well, then the entire world collapses and then nobody wins. Doesn't make any sense. If you have two different systems running in parallel, you can juggle between the two and you have a better balance. It's all about balancing in life, people. Always has been. And then, of course, the big one is justice. We need to advocate for a system of justice that holds institutions accountable for their actions, ensuring that those who profit and exploit, there's nothing wrong with profits. That's a very important thing in business. There's turnover, profit, and cash flow. You need that. Without that, you have no business. So there's, there's nothing wrong with having that in a company. You need that. But it shouldn't be at the detriment and exploitation of other companies and other people that doesn't make sense to do that because there's no longevity in that business so there needs to be this so people can be held accountable and for their choices and that's important so this is what i'm calling for because it's critical here and then ultimately you know it, it, it's an important thing to think about because as much as i'd say these companies are exceptionally powerful and they're managing 352 odd trillion dollars out of the total pot of 440 trillion dollars it's not a system that you can get rid of and, and and it shouldn't be thought of that way but it does need to be more transparent there does need to be a lot more thought process in terms of future thinking and not this this ideology of divisiveness um public discourse, negative thought process, all this kind of stuff that's causing things like DEI implementation. I can understand in certain type of scenarios, you may need to have a bit more equality here and there, but what doesn't work is protecting the minority so that you can actually jeopardize the majority. It doesn't work. The numbers don't lie. It's happening around every industry and every sector. So companies out there that have been invested in by BlackRock, Stateside, and Vanguard. Think about this carefully. Yes, there, it's an important system to have. But at the same time, we need to think of a, a better way to do this because ultimately it's going to lead to the demise of mankind. And more importantly, even those companies themselves, which is showing you very clearly in history from the past where we're going and you can clearly see that there is if they continue on this path there is no actual future for those companies but at the same time it will completely break down mankind which means what are we going to do we're going to start again we're going to start again and mankind has to go from the beginning again what a waste what a complete waste mankind is designed to think balanced People are designed to be balanced in life. We operate at our optimal conditions, optimal thinking, optimal physically, mentally, when we are balanced in life. Unbalancing companies, unbalancing people, unbalancing their thought process, their politics and all that only does one thing. It benefits your pockets in the short term. And that has the opposite effect on everybody in the short term and the long term, which ultimately will turn that around. It'll actually turn around and you will have such tremendous animosity 
antagonizing just dangers against your companies that basically BlackRock and Stateside and, 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 and Vanguard and all these other financial institutions, JP Morgan and all the rest of them, they will ultimately fail. Because there's only a certain amount of time that you can hold back people. And when you once you start taking away that freedom of choice, people will rebel and then you'll have a much bigger problem in your hands. You won't have a problem of just surviving, you'll have a problem of being totally annihilated. Keep that in your minds very, very, very closely because it's very important. Now, I didn't want to sound any negative to you with everybody who's watching and listening. I, that wasn't the objective of this. I was hoping really to shine some light, some light into this whole tunnel. And just to show you, look, this is an important system that we have. It's very important that we have these financial institutes. But at the same time, we are wielding a behemoth beast. And like anything in life... There needs to be balance because if there isn't, it's going to cause a demise of something. And in our case, it'll demise pretty much everything else. So that's all I wanted to shed a light on today. I'm thanking you for your time. Much appreciated. I hope I'm not ruffling any feathers with this. This is nothing new. All this information is available online. You can look it up. I just wanted to shed some light into this and just show you why the world is upside down right now. Everything. All the industries, comics industries, television industry, film industries, music industry, commerce companies, media themselves, uh, social media platforms, governments, all of that that's happening and that's going wrong is all because of this. And there is a better way to do this. And that is for calling for more transparency, accountability and structure. And more importantly, not to constantly only line the pockets of these filthy rich companies. Look, they have to do this. They've got to protect their assets. It makes sense. Perfect sense. But it's also narrow thinking into thinking that to try and keep that power, maintain that power, and protect their assets is to divide people and to, to cause um, unfairness and social discourse and change policies and destroy things that's very narrow-minded because you're letting the thought process corrupt you guys without thinking the future could be vastly more beneficial if you actually change the way you think and you now protect mankind it's just weigh it out put a spreadsheet together and look at the risk portfolio and you can see it straight away it just makes more sense when every single human on the planet is benefiting, because all they will do is when they, when, you, when you have a force of people and they've got an incredible leader, they will fight for the leader and die for their leader. It's called patriotism. Right. If you lose that and you're only concerned about yourselves as companies, in a battle, your own subjects are going to turn away and you're going to be facing an entire enemy, both the enemy across you and within. If you think about it in the art of war, that is the biggest mistake you can possibly make. So to the companies out there, BlackRock, Vanguard, Stateside, JP Morgan, Chase, there's so many companies out there that do this. This is a call out to you. You're not doing the right thing. You're thinking the wrong way. You know that you've got to do what you've got to do, which makes sense, and you've got to continue doing those things. But you've got to think about certain things that you're doing which are not working correctly for you. Because you can see that everything in the world may be panning out the way you've strategized, but actually, when people start to check out and start to say, I'm done, and don't start buying, stop buying stuff, Stop moving money around the markets. Stop being interested in products and services. Stop doing things with companies or whatever. Your well of money will dry out. And men and women are more resilient, and kids as well, they're more resilient to freedom and having their freedom than they are to gaining anything else. Because when push comes to shove, <laughs> people will choose their freedom first over everything else that they have, including money and finances. And those who don't, those are the ones who fall prey to this, unfortunately. So, a call out to everybody out there. 
and thank you all for listening. I just wanted to shed some light into this whole situation. And really, just there's positive things about this. There's very important positive things around this industry. And they, it's not just the negative side I want to show. There's also a lot of positives here. But remember that if you don't know all the facts, how will you be able to just say, okay, well, these companies have something positive. You've something negative. You've got to always look at both the good and the bad and weigh out what works. And without understanding the bad stuff and also knowing the good stuff, you can't really know whether the, the companies are genuine or not. And of course, these companies are genuine, but some of their activities that they're doing are not going to work out to be genuine. And unfortunately, it's a lot more visual today and they are losing. And they know they are. This is why the weapon of division has been activated, because it is a very strategic tool in war and battle, yes, but it's also a sign of stress and a sign of concern from their perspective, which means it shows that they're losing. We don't want the system to collapse. Of course, nobody wants that. Nobody wants any companies to fail over. There's a lot of jobs at stake here, but we want a more transparent, more accountable, more fair system that gives not just equal opportunity for everything. No, it's not about equal opportunity. It gives fair opportunity without compromise and without exploitation. Then it's just up to the best of the best to succeed, not to get to the point where you succeed and because you're not falling in within the narrative to be shunned away and blocked away and, and, and sort of closed up and then you can't function anymore. That doesn't make any sense. It doesn't fulfill the long-term strategies of mankind. Right. Thank you all for listening. My name is Demetrius again, once again from Obi Pixel, And I hope this has been something to think about and a bit more eye-opening. And uh, I'm signing out.